Hi, my name's Phil and I enjoy talking politics and the winner for the poll this time was in terms of what is Jeremy Corbyn's opposition to the EU. So Jeremy Corbyn, for those who don't know, is the official leader of the opposition. He is the leader of the only other party that realistically could form a government in Britain were there in order the general election. Um, but what I'm going to have to do for this video is, is, as well as, of course, answer what is opposition to the EU, it's quite important that I start off by addressing another point. There was quite an interesting little comment made on the poll, which was, I was unaware that Jeremy Corbyn had any opposition to the EU. The media says he has, but I don't ever recall him seeing him campaign against the EU in the build-up to the referendum. Isn't this just spin to smear him yet again? You can only throw so much muck before people get tired and people start seeing things for what they really are, a smear campaign. Now, I would totally get why some people might say that. In theory, yes, Jeremy Corbyn was campaigning for Remain. And you will find, if you Google it, Google Images, you will find no end of, of images of Jeremy Corbyn in front of a Remain banner. Um, however, he didn't, he didn't really campaign for Remain, but I'll get onto that in a moment. It is, of course, true there are lots of parts of the media that want to smear him. He's, there's, a, there's a lot of people hugely hostile, and they're not just hostile because he's the leader of the Labour Party in the way that they're generally hostile to other leaders of the Labour Party. They are particularly hostile against him because he re represents a serious threat to their way of life. Now, so I, I can totally get why you would say that. Um, however... Jeremy Corbyn is a very long-standing politician. He has been around for donkey's years. He's been an MP for decades. And what is particularly curious about Jeremy Corbyn is when he votes in Parliament, he votes the way he wants to vote. He does not care a fig about towing the party line. That's why I, I sort of say every now and then that he has no moral authority to make his own MPs follow his line because he never did it when other Labour leaders were in charge and he was a backbencher. In fact, he voted against his own party, I think something like 80 times. He's a serial, um, screw you. And um, But if you want to know, particularly for a politician like that, what they really think of a thing, you don't listen to what they say, although there's plenty of that. You look at their voting record. So here is... A snapshot, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, we'll be here all day. You know, since the 70s, Jeremy Corbyn has had an opportunity to vote for or against any number of issues related to the European community, the European Union now, or Britain's role within it. So the first one, we had a referendum in 1975, we, we joined the EEC, and then there was a referendum saying, do you want to stay in the EEC? He voted for Britain to leave that. Okay, that was a while ago. Much more recently, in 1993, uh, with the Maastricht Treaty, not only did he speak out against it, that he also voted against that. Okay. Uh, in fact, during, although we say technically he campaigned for Remain, we didn't really. I mean, apart from anything else, he went on holiday during the campaign. So there are only really a couple of times when they managed to chuck him out in front of a board and say, say something, will you? And he just went, uh... We should stay. Right, I'm done. Uh, that was literally what he did. Uh, he went on, literally, during the campaign, this super important thing, he pissed off. He didn't go on holiday because he was desperate for a holiday. He went on holiday because he just didn't want to deal with it. Uh, it's actually ironic. I find this ironic. I've just said that he constantly campaigned against his own party. Oh, sorry, voted against his own party. He didn't campaign against it. Voted against his own party so many times. The only time I've ever seen him tow the party line is ironically when he became leader. As leader, there are a few things he chunters about, but he sort of has to do. That's weird. I find that weird. Anyway, he also voted against the Lisbon Treaty uh, in 2008. 2010, he voted against the creation of the European Union's diplomatic service. Um, he voted for a referendum on EU in 2011, which obviously didn't go through at the time, but he voted in favour of that. He opposed the creation of the EU's European Stability Mechanism. You know, um, I mean that, you know, he was one of only a tiny number of MPs that voted against that. This was, you know, I, mean, I don't even know that that had too much to do with us. Um, what did he else, what else has he voted for? Against the EU's banking authority, you know. Um, 
he also, after the, even though he was technically on Remain, as soon as the referendum result came through, he immediately said that Article 50 should be triggered. Now, I know on that point, if you, if, if you were looking at the rest of his voting record, you might say, well, that might be a cunning plan for Remainer. Get it started as soon as possible. The sooner you get it started, the sooner we can cock it up and finish this whole mess. But no, I mean, if you look at his voting record, I've just given you a snapshot. He has voted against any expansion or increased powers of the EU, any increased role within the EU for us, every single time. Every single time. Um, and there's a lot of votes over the last few decades, as you can imagine. He's always voted against it, every single time. That is not the voting record of someone who's pro-EU. That is the voting record of someone who does not want the EU to exist. And if it must exist, he does not want Britain to have any part of it. So hopefully that sorts that out. Um, now, in terms of why he opposes the EU, now, I think there are two reasons to this. I think there's two little different strands. I think one of them is his global sense of fair play and his, the other one is his designs for Britain, should he become prime minister. Now, here's the thing. Um, say what you will about Jeremy Corbyn, and I have said plenty. I think that fundamentally he is a fair-minded person. I think that he genuinely wants equity for everyone but around the world. He wants everyone to be treated equally. He wants everyone to have the same opportunities, same access to, to everything across the world. Now, that would be fine were he a philanthropist and he was supporting projects in poorer countries. Great. We'd, we'd laud him for that. But when you want to lead a government, it is your duty to bat for that country. You need to be empowering that country and empowering its people. And here is the issue. If you want everyone in the world to be equal, you are accepting the fact that of the many poorer people in the world, and bear in mind, we have people suffering the indignities of poverty in this country. However, even their lives, which are not what they should be living in this country, are still the envy of the genuinely global poor, you know. So if you're going to raise all those people, and so we're all going to be about equal, you've got to massively increase the wealth of those genuinely much poorer people in the world. Now, it is true that if you were to, if he was king of the world and decided all the rules, it would increase productivity. We know that it would increase productivity if we had no barriers to trade or movement, if you just completely eliminated them. Uh, in fact, it was believed that when passports permanently became a thing about 100 years ago, if they had, and it was touch and go, it was nearly, if it weren't for the First World War, we reckon it wouldn't have been a thing. I don't know whether it would have been a thing since, but it certainly wouldn't have at the time. If it had never been a thing, so you had proper free movement, they reckon now we would, the world would be twice as productive as it is. So, the world cake would be twice as big. But that is still not big enough to raise everyone up to our level of wealth. So, inevitably, if you're going to have everyone the same, you're going to be raising the poorer up but you will be suppressing the wealthier. And we are the wealthier, even if, you know, we can see even more ludicrous extremes of wealth that we can only aspire to or dream of. Nonetheless, we are, globally speaking, if you're in a first world country, a developed country, even if you're relatively low down within that country, you are wealthy globally. And and, and that is the, the major issue from my point of view, um, as Prime Minister, you cannot be pursuing those sorts of things because it is to make your own nation poorer. But I think that's part of it because the EU, of course, is a very protectionist organisation. The purpose of the EU is to empower its own members. That means at the expense of those who are not members. It's to make them wealthier at the expense of those who are not members. And that doesn't sit right with him. But I think his other objection is the more philosophical objection to state aid rules. And people have asked about this, you know, the EU state aid rules. So the policies with which I agree with Jeremy Corbyn tend to be along the lines of state ownership, nationalisation of key public services. I do not like the idea that key public services that we are reliant upon we can be overpaying for them because part of the money we're paying has to go into profits and also the fact that they're run not for our benefit, they're not actually a service. 
They're just trying to extract as much money out of us as they can. And frequently the service is very poor. Thing is, he fears that the EU rules would, the EU rules, sorry, would hamper him in nationalising those industries or at least, well, if not make it completely impossible. Now, what are the state uh, rules, the state aid rules? Basically, in a nutshell, you cannot give, as a government, you cannot give financial aid to some companies, but not to others, if there's a chance that it could prevent fair competition. Okay, so the rules are all about ensuring that competition is possible. Um, and there's a little quote here, it says, any aid grant granted by member states or through state resources in any form whatsoever, which distorts or threatens to distort competition by favouring certain undertakings, or the production of certain goods shall, insofar as it affects trade between member states, be incompatible with the internal market. Waffle, waffle, waffle. Gives a few examples of sort of things you can't do. So you're not allowed direct state grants or subsidies, such as a rescue aid, tax or other social security exemptions, loans at preferential interest rates, guarantees or indemnities on favourable terms, preferential grants or loans, disposal of land or buildings at less than full market value, debt write-offs, waiving of profits or other returns on public funds, export assistance, sweeteners to attract investment into a region, or forgiveness of liabilities, for example, employer social security payments or license fees. So it, but the thing is, it doesn't actually prevent you nationalising industries. All it really does is say, okay, you've got this public service and it's a national company. You've still got to allow private companies, if they believe that they can offer that same service and sell it, you can't hinder them. That's all it requires of you. Don't hinder it. And we know that this is true because there are countries that have nationalised services in the EU. Germany, quite famously. There are a few others as well, Scandinavian countries. But Germany particularly so because it's also quite powerful. I think there was supposed to be a proposal for making tightening up the state eight rules. But Germany immediately squashed it down. They said, no, we're not having that. Um, and that's the thing, you know, within Germany, we would have a good ally. They have a very effective industrial, um, well, attitude, really. You know, the, the great thing about Germany is it has long term planning and that allows them to be able to produce like more than twice as much as us. We don't in this country. It's all short termism. It's all, you know, politicians only care about enacting things for which there's going to be a benefit before the next election. The last thing they want to do is put something in place where you're not going to see the benefit for 20 years because it's like, hang on a minute, I'm not going to take the credit. All I'm going to do is get blamed for spending money. Some other bugger 20 years down the line is going to take the credit for it. That's not fair. They don't like that. So they only put things in if it's going to get a quick return. Well, that's not a way to run a country in the long term. You know, it's all about short term targets. Not like that with Germany, you know, and we, we could learn from that. And as I say, for Corbyn, there would be an ally in Germany in trying to adapt that, you know, system. The other thing is there are exemptions to the state aid rules. You, as long as you're not blocking competition, you know, there's a there's a lot you can do. Um, he doesn't need to ban private companies to, from nationalised services anyway, because at the end of the day, a private company there's two issues which will just naturally make it difficult to compete without you hindering them from competing. One is that they have to make a profit. A nationalised industry doesn't. It provides its service. It bills accordingly. It doesn't need buckets of money being poured in by the government. It doesn't need that. It'll be self-sustaining. You know, it still charges for its services. It uses that money to pay its wages, pay its facilities, pay its materials pay for its research and development. That's all fine. The other companies have to do all that and make a profit. And they're smaller. You don't, you know, you can't have a, you'd, you'd have a series of private companies operating in different parts of the countries. So they can't run as efficiently, despite what they try and say about, oh, private industry runs so much efficiently. No, it doesn't run efficiently. How can it? How can a tiny company, which has to have its own managers and, and HR company departments and research and development and all the rest of it the things that you need compete with on a globe on a national scale sorry where some of these jobs that you've got to have in a tiny company well you you can just have a smaller number for the whole nation no. anyway so I, I don't think i don't think that 
cuts any ice. But but that seems to be a reason. The other thing is, I remember that before the Conservatives won power, Gordon Brown had talked about this broadband tax. It was basically was going to work out 50p a person. And they were going to roll out good quality broadband throughout the country. Now, unfortunately, that never happened because the Conservatives thought, oh, something that actually will boost our business growth. Now, that's not a good idea, is it? Um, but there were no issues with state aid rules there. No one brought up any issues there. That was actually going to be a thing. Uh, but no. The other thing is that, that seems to be putting him off um, is, is I'll tell you what I find really weird, actually, before I go into that. He keeps talking about it being essential we are in a customs union, which I agree with. But he keeps doing it. And he seems to do it so cheerfully that I actually believe this. I don't think he's just saying it. He wants us to form. Now, admittedly, he doesn't say the customs union. He says a customs union as if he wants to write his own rules. But his rules seem to be he wants us to be in customs union with the EU. But he wants us also to be able to pick and choose rules. That's never happening. If we're in the customs union, we follow those rules. But anyway... He wants us to be in the customs union. But just like I've said, if we're in the customs union, we have to uphold state aid rules. I mean, I'm not sure if anyone has ever interviewed him about this discrepancy. I've not seen anything written where someone's actually asked him to, to qualify those two statements. But anyway, the other thing as well is that state aid rules are actually, you'd, you'd think they should find favour with Jeremy Corbyn because another thing they prevent, again, along lines of unfair competition, is it prevents the state from allowing massive corporations to take the piss with tax avoidance, you know, tax breaks. Um, without the state aid rules, the Conservatives would have free reign to let big business run rampant. So not only would the tax receipts go down to not people not earning as much, but also they'd go down because not as much corporation tax would be paid because they'd be allowing them all these tax breaks. Um, absolute madness. Absolute madness. Because he must know, even if he believes he can get into government, there's going to come a time when he's gone again and the Conservatives are back in, at which point they'll just be able to wreck everything without, without these EU rules and it will be quick and easy for them to do it. And now, there are some state aid rules, of course, which might hinder him because it may well be that he doesn't just want nationalised companies to be able to offer these services, that he does specifically want to stop private companies doing it as well, uh, in which case, yes, those state aid rules would hinder him. But the problem is that leaving the EU doesn't stop him having to follow those rules. And I'm no longer talking about if we stay in the customs union. If we actually have a no-deal Brexit, we still have to follow those rules. No, not the EU's rules, but then the EU's rules are basically mapped from the World Trade Organization rules. World Trade, Organi World Trade Organization has all sorts of rules. It's not just tariffs and it's not just quotas that I talked about recently. They also have state aid rules that basically prohibit all of those same things. And we would be bound by them even if we're on our own wet little island on its own, completely isolated. And no, we can't just leave the World Trade Organization because what little protection we do get, we get, well, we're going to need it as the only country in the world ever to choose to have no trade deals with any other nation on earth. Um, we are going to need all the protection we can get. And what little protection we're going to get is from the WTO. Um, so no, we can't just leave it. Then the last little thing I should probably just add in here, because I keep seeing little comments about, oh, Jeremy Corbyn is going to push for a new referendum. And every time I look at this and I try and find out, it's like, I can't see any evidence of this. Who's saying this? I, I think that might be a media smear um, because he is resisting it. I, at some point, he may have to push for it because the rest of his part at the moment, obviously, the vast majority of his MPs want it. Uh, not all, but the vast majority. And certainly the vast majority of the grassroots want it. But he is resisting it. And why is he resisting it? He is, he does, or he feels himself to be in a bit of a quandary. Someone was saying recently, and I checked up on this. So basically, he's seen a poll that sort of says, we know, for example, okay, in the last general election, he did not win enough support to be able to form a government. So in the next general election, whenever that is, and he wants to push for it to be as soon as possible, he wants to get into government, so he says anyway, and that means he needs to increase his support. So the one thing you want to do when you want to increase your support is you don't really want to lose support. But that being said, so he's seen a poll which says 
you know, there's actually, do you know what? There's a shitload of people who voted Brexit um, and voted Labour. And actually, do you know what? If you were to push for another referendum, we'd probably lose their support. And he's gone, oh, my God, no. Um, I mean, the other thing is, I don't think he wants it anyway. He wants us to leave, like I've just said. But I think that's also why he's resisting doing what his party is screaming at him to do. But the other thing is, I've, there are other polls as well. The, you've got to be careful with polls. And there's two aspects to polls where you have to be a little bit cautious. One is, they can get things wrong. People say, oh, the pollsters don't know what they're doing. They do. If you, you, if you ask a question in just slightly the wrong way, you can get a misleading answer. Um, and a lot of, some polls can actually be, privately funded and therefore they ask questions in such a way as to elicit a particular answer now i am actually signed up for YouGov polls myself so i fill in polls every now and then and okay at the end of it does ask you what you thought of them occasionally they're generally okay but occasionally i will have to say that a particular question was biased and, and lent you to to answer in a particular way which was not representative um and and, and some of those can be like that as well but there have been Multiple polls, and when it's multiple and asked in different ways, it tends to be a bit more reliable, but you'd still have to be a little bit cautious. That suggest, well, for a start, I mean, we must know. There are far more Labour supporters that want now to remain, whether they voted Leave or not before, they now have seen, you know. Um, so, and he, and he could risk, if he doesn't, because everyone sees Jeremy Corbyn as having the ability to deal with this right now. He could push for a referendum right now. And he would almost certainly get the support. We can never tell until it's put to the test in Parliament. But he'd very likely get the support. And certainly if he whipped his MPs, yes, some would ignore him. Like I said, he's got no moral authority to whip them anyway. But the majority would go with his line. And it would only need, you know, I mean, there'd be some Conservatives that may do that as well. In which case it could go through. Of course, we'd have to apply for an extension at the same time. It would all have to be part of the same, you know, bill. Um, in which case... If they see him as having the power to do that, whether rightly or wrongly, they will also see that by not doing it, they're condemning them to losing their jobs and all the rest of it. So he's he's potentially going to lose an awful lot more support. You know, he's it's like he's going to lose support either way. He's got to pick a side. The side he's picking at the moment is not the greater part of, of the Labour support. That is the issue. That is the problem. So I'm going to say that in terms of his reasons for not wanting us in the EU and his reasons for resisting the referendum. I think he's misguided on both. And I don't, I don't mean he's wrong on both. I think he is wrong on both. But even in terms of what he wants, I think he's wrong. And, uh, and, and, and that's my view on that one. But that is, those are the reasons why he, he doesn't want us in the EU. He doesn't even want the EU to exist. And also you know why he is resisting the referendum because no matter how many people keep saying oh he's going to back it and he may one day but he is not at the moment i've seen no sign of it at all apart from anything else i would expect that if it became labor's official policy to push for another referendum i would instantly expect an email from labor um, asking for my support on that and that hasn't happened either so anyway hopefully that answers a few questions i hope you enjoyed the video if you did don't forget to like comment subscribe and share for further content Click the bell notification as well, and then you'll be polled, uh, notified of the next poll. As you're watching this, there will already be a new poll up for what video you want to go live tomorrow. And until next time, I'll see you later.